Now let's get to it. Why don't you grab your Bible, turn with me to Genesis. I've got something the Lord has put on my heart to share. Um, and it's something, you know, it's it, one of the things that I love doing is meeting with guys. And I try to do that as much as I can. Uh, just, it's good to, to kind of, you know, uh, I, I know that sometimes in bigger churches, sometimes pastors just stop meeting. Um, and you might think, well, Brett, I've heard you don't meet with uh, everybody. Well, I don't meet with everybody. That's true because there's uh, so many people, a lot of people in this church, and it's hard to keep up with that. But I, I do uh, meet with a lot of guys during the week just because it's something I love doing. Um, but one of the things uh, that's good about meeting with guys, and I think no pastor should ever stop, you know, just, you know, just cold turkey, being a study, studying for sermons. I think that the, you lose touch with reality and what, what guys are feeling and going through, and you can almost uh, become sort of spiritually esoteric and just and not really connect. And so one of the reasons I like talking with guys during the week is, it's just kind of a finger on the pulse of what, what are guys dealing with and what are we wrestling with? And, and that's part of what this Ironworks is. You know, I don't really do topical teaching on Sundays and Wednesdays, um, but Ironworks, you'll note, I just kind of choose topics. Uh, and you might say, well, how do you choose the topics? And it comes from two main things. Um, our pastoral care team and myself, we kind of talk about what are, the, what are the brothers struggling with or what are the things we're dealing with? Um, and then also just me talking to the guys in the church. And so that's what kind of prompts some of these topics. Today is one such topic that I've seen uh, a detrimental uh, sort of behavior that is part of human nature. But I think particularly as men, it's, it's, um, it's something we're prone to do, but it's also more destructive uh, than we might even think. But it's a behavior that we often, you know, employ without even thinking about it sometimes. And what I'm gonna call this is uh, dangerous detours. Uh, dangerous detours that we take in life. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. You know, is a detour a good thing or a bad thing? Have you ever thought about that? Um, I remember one time it was a good thing. Debbie and I were uh, speaking of four-wheel drive and stuff. I, I like off-roading and dunes and stuff like that. I'll, I'll uh, take my dirt bike out with, uh, from time to time with the guys or, um, or my truck. I like going off, off-road. Um, but um, but one, of the, one of the things that happened quite a few years ago now, but uh, it's, it's one of those fun memories because this could have gone really bad. But uh, we were down in Grants Pass coming back up to Portland and down just before Mount Sexton, there was a, um, there was a uh, stop in the freeway. I think it was a wreck um, that they were pulling off the, you know, somewhere up on the hill there. And the cars were just stopped on the freeway. Um, and um, and the, there was only one little exit, the Hugo exit. If you, if you know that area, Hugo, uh, not a lot of things going on in the thriving metropolis of Hugo, Oregon. But but I, I, uh, I knew from some friends that there were some back roads back there, you know, dirt roads that were kind of, you know, logging roads and stuff that um, could get you over Mount Sexton uh, and uh, get you back on, you know. And I, I you know, I'd, I'd heard, you know, on the radio that the, 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 the traffic block was going to be hours, you know. So um, put, the, put the F-150 in four-wheel drive and poof, took off. I took the exit at Hugo and I uh, kind of plotted it out, but I sort of didn't know exactly where I was going. Debbie had a sense of that. She was with me. Um, uh, she, she thought, oh no, we're gonna get a lot. Here we go again, you know, but, and I, and, and, you know, but I was feeling confident, you know, but it's kind of fun And my truck, just kind of, you know, pedal to the metal on the dirt roads and just, uh, you know, uh, um, but there was this one section, even I was starting to doubt because it got to be almost less than a logging road. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was, uh, looked like a, nobody had traveled over that road for three or four years, maybe. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm kind of going through this stuff. And, but, um, but sure enough, it kind of broke open and I had another logging road and then uh, over the mountain and back. And eventually, I forget what the on-ramp was, but um, here was the great thing. Uh, I timed myself. Uh, you guys that are like me, you know, you know why you did that. Um, but uh, uh, 28 minutes uh, it, it took uh, to get from Hugo exit over Sexton uh, and onto the next on-ramp. Uh, and, uh, and I'm just going to uh, say I was flying. Uh, and poor Debbie, you know, she made new hand grips in the truck, you know. Um, but, but it was one of those moments I just felt so satisfied. It was a, it was a detour that was helpful. And, uh, and it, we, I, we saved hours and hours. I, I was kind of chuckling, thinking of all those cars sitting there waiting for the you know, traffic to be cleared. Um, but, but one of the things that um, the problem in life is when do you know is, it's a good detour and it's going to work out or when it's a bad detour uh, and you should probably not have taken it? Because uh, I've got other stories where I tried that and it probably took 10 times longer, uh, uh, you know, to get where I was trying to go. 
Um, uh, it has a lot to do with, um, you know, whether or not the Lord is in it in the detour. You know, when you're driving down the road and there's a detour, um, there, there actually are some good things, um, you know, that, that, that might do in life. You know, road detours exist because usually construction's taking place. Um, and I've found that the Lord will detour my life because he's got some work to do on, on my life. Uh, and so that's a good t- detour. Um, you know, it's usually because, you know, workers are trying to fix or build or correct or improve. And so similarly, God will take you and me on detours in this life. And, um, and you know, granted, detours uh, are anything but convenient. Uh, you know, they're oftentimes troublesome and time-consuming and, um, you know, mess up your travel plans sometimes. But but one thing we also have to learn is God is more, I think, interested in your development and construction. You know, you're a work in progress. Uh, he cares more about your character than he does your comfort. Um, and so some of those detours in life, you know, the Lord wants you to, to be fixed and, and changed and transformed. Um, the detour is always worse than the main road, but you still might get where you're wanting to go. And in life, there's some of those detours that the Lord uh, has for us. But the detours that are not good are the ones that are almost like we're distracted somehow or we're taking a detour, getting our eye off the ball or off God's will for our lives. And we start taking detours without God's lead, without the Holy Spirit leading us. That's where as men, we find ourselves in big trouble. Those detours are not as much uh, learning moments as just stupid moments uh, where we took the wrong turn and and we went a different direction. All throughout the Bible, there's uh, examples of men who took the wrong turn. Um, There might be one of the greatest wrong turns uh, in the world's history, maybe. I'll show you why here in a second, but we find that in Genesis chapter 12. Why don't you turn there with me? Genesis chapter 12. And if you know your Bible, you're already kind of like, okay, all right, I think I know what detour we're talking about. Because um, uh, one of the great pillars of faith uh, he's, he's actually called the father of faith in all the Bible. That's a pretty good title. If you're called the father of faith, man, this must be a faith, faithful man. And he was, but he also made one of the worst detours in the history of the world, um, which gives me hope uh, because I've made some wrong turns in my life too. But it's Genesis chapter 12. We pick up the story of Abraham. Uh, of course, you might say, why is he called Abram in some of the Bible and then Abraham in some of the Bible? What's the, what's the difference? Well, God will give him a new name from Abram to Abraham, uh, but uh, this is early still, uh, and so he's called Abram here. But um, one of the things you should know, you know, before we even really meet Abraham in the Bible, uh, he, he already kind of lived a bunch of life. Uh, we forget that. We think of him as some young buck in Genesis 12, get, you know, getting a call on his life from God. And we think of that, you know, that's pretty cool. But he'd already lived a, a pretty pretty long life so far. Like he lived in Ur of the Chaldees, which is what modern day t- today would be Iraq. Uh, and, um, and there uh, in the Ur of the Chaldees, you know, they were uh, very uh, wealthy and living large in those days. If you were from Ur of the Chaldees, you were like from Lake Oswego by the lake. That was kind of the same sort of deal. Um, did you know in Ur of the Chaldees, archeological digs, they found beautiful houses that were very ornate, that are very ancient. Um, and uh, they believe there were, they even had hot tubs and stuff like that in their own homes uh, in some of these uh, places in Ur of the Chaldees. So some people believe, you know, Abraham was, you know, settled, living large, when suddenly the Lord says, I want you to get out of Ur of the Chaldees. Uh, I want you to be a sojourner and travel. And this is where the Lord's, this is a good detour. I want you to get away from this place and I'm going to take you to a land that's beautiful and it's going to be wonderful and it's going to be your own. Uh, and, uh, and so Abraham pulls up stakes and starts headed toward that. Now, it takes him a while to get to the land of promise uh, that God has for him. But, uh, but you know, he does pretty good. He, you know, he waits a little while and there's a thing with his dad that we could talk about. But, um, but largely he ends up getting there um, to, to the promised land. Um, and that's where we sort of pick it up here in our text. In Genesis 12, uh, verse, verses 8 uh, through 12, let's look at that section here. So um, it says in Genesis 12, 8, And he, Abraham, removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed 
uh, going on still south, the southward. Now, um, the first thing, where, we, where do we start our story this morning? Well, he's, he's here, Abraham, he's here between Bethel and Hai, which is kind of a funny thing. In the Bible, the names of cities and people and stuff like that, the names have great significance. Um, I think that none of these city names are just um, there for no reason. Uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of rewarding if you look up these names. But I, I find it interesting. Um, you guys probably know what Bethel means. Does anybody know what Bethel means? House of the Lord, house of God, um, Bethel. Um, and so uh, that's kind of a known one. There's a lot of uh, you know, churches, uh, you know, that used to call themselves Bethel and then the big Bethel ministry started, but we won't get off on that tangent, uh, the Bethel um, uh, weirdness. But, um, but all that to say, uh, Bethel is a good word, even though it's a kind of a funny, a strange church, but Bethel means house of God. Now, Hai means, anybody know what that means? Heap of ruin. <laughs> a heap of ruin, or uh, or some of your dictionaries will say dump, like a like a pile of dump, garbage, you know. And so, so where is Abraham? He's between house of God and heap of ruin. Uh, you know, uh, this is this is funny to me because um, you know, with uh, Abraham, the house of God is ahead of him, and the dump is on the other side of him. And that's basically where you and I live. We live somewhere between the heap of ruin and the house of God. And the question is, where are you at right now? Are you in the pile of garbage or are you in the house of God? Well, Brett, I'm here at church on Saturday morning and it's even snowy outside, come on, you know, give me a break. Um, well, yeah, I mean, uh, but just because we're sitting in this uh, building, a, a church building, doesn't necessarily mean that we're uh, in the place of, of rightness. But you, you kind of love where Abraham's at. He's, he's here between this place, but he builds an altar. That, that's a good sign of Abraham's heart. Uh, to the Lord. Now, if you're new to the Bible, the altars of the Old Testament point to the cross of the New Testament. Anytime you talk about a, a, an altar, there's sacrifice there. It's, it's um, recognizing your sin. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin or remission of sin. And so the altars in the Bible uh, are often pictures of, of making a right relationship between you and God. And so that's really what's being pictured here. Abraham's in a good place. He, he's right, right here between Bethel and Hai and he builds an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. That's a good sign. If you're a man who is at the cross, uh, the, the modern day altar, and worshiping at the feet of Jesus and calling on the name of the Lord, that usually is a good sign that you're doing something right. When was the last time you really called on the name of the Lord and when you, uh, you know, were repentant before the Lord for your sins? That's something that I think every man should have a regular part of his walk is to be a, have an altered life if you would, where we uh, come, come to the Lord. You know, Jesus said, do this often in remembrance of me. That's why communion is so important. Um, we sin a lot um, and it's good to reset the dials back to zero frequently and, and start over and, and do that regularly and kind of reset. That's one of the things I love about our Lord. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Uh, that's why you and I should be brothers who continually come to the Lord constantly are calling on the name of the Lord. Um, that's where Abraham finds himself here. Um, so with heaven before us, the world behind us, uh, we're camped out in the middle. Sometimes we're, uh, we take a, a dangerous detour, however, more toward the heap of ruin. Um, and that's where we pick it up in the next section here in Genesis 12, verse 10. It says, verse 10, and there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt. I've got that marked in my Bible, down to Egypt. That's a phrase you should be familiar with in the Bible. Uh, whenever they go down to Egypt, we got some bad stuff coming. Uh, does anybody know what Egypt is a type of in the Bible? The world, godlessness, sinfulness. Egypt is a picture of that throughout the whole Bible. So whenever you have an Egypt story, you can kind of go, uh-oh, you know, what's going on here? Um, and, and, you know, what happened to the children of Israel while they were in Egypt? Slaves, uh, that's what the world wants to do. The world wants to enslave you, uh, put you in chains and bondage. It's funny to me how the world presents its lures um, to, you know, as something that's so liberating. 
Um, I'm sure there's some secular dudes out there that would say, oh, you Christians are in bondage to trying to be good, you know, do-gooders and holy Joes and, you know, not, you, you, you don't drink and chew and you don't go with girls that do and all that stuff. And you're, you know, like, like there's a thing that's like you Christians are in bondage, but I would just say the ap- absolute opposite is true. It's when you're in the world that you're in bondage, man. You're in chains to addictions and lust and your heart is connected to things that shouldn't be and you're losing life and direction. And the world you know, has many lures and promises, but it really, that's, that's the true bondage. So whenever the children of Israel were in Egypt, they were, they were in, you know, in chains and bondage. But um, you know, all that to say, that's kind of a, a thing in the Bible. Uh, whenever people go down to Egypt, uh, look out. Well, that's what happens. Uh, there's famine in the land. So verse 10, Abram goes down to Egypt to sojourn there for the famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass, verse 11, when he was come near to enter e- into Egypt, that he said uh, to Sarai, his wife, she gets another name later too, Sarah, but it's Sarai and Abram right now. So he, he says to Sarai, his wife, behold now, I um, know that thou art a fair woman to look, up, look upon. Well, I love that. Shouldn't every husband feel that about his wife? Um, now, was Abraham accurate in this? Was she a fair woman to look upon? Well, should we even care about that? Oh, we, we should. It's part of the story. Um, but he, he, he says, you know, honey, you're, you're a really pretty girl. Uh, um, but uh, here's the funniest part of the story. She's about 65 years old right here. Uh, man, I know you're 65, honey, but man, you're still really hot. Uh, and uh, we, this is going to be a problem for me. Um, now, this will be tested. Is Sarah hot or not? Um, Brett, we shouldn't even talk about this. This is a men's thing. No, this is part of the story. Um, uh, you know, he said, you're a fair woman to look upon. Verse 12, therefore, it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall see thee, um, they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me because they will save thee alive. Uh, Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me. I said it that way uh, with a little emphasis, because I want you to, it'll be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. And the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And verse 16, he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. Um, now pause here for a second. What, so, so, so far the story is kind of crazy. Uh, what husband does this? What man in his right mind says, honey, you're my sister. Now, is this an out and out lie? Well, um, it's not an out and out lie, uh, but what's the old saying? I think it's a Yiddish proverb that says, you know, a, ha- um, a half truth is nothing but a whole lie. Um, and this is kind of a half truth. You learn later on, I think it's around Gen- uh, Genesis 26, I think somewhere where um, we read about uh, Abraham's um, you know, uh, wife was technically his half-sister. Um, well, Brett, is that legal? Um, well, it wasn't once the law was given, but remember the law hadn't been given yet. Uh, was Abraham right to marry his half-sister? Uh, we could make a big argument about that. But one of the things I like about this whole thing, I'm taking kind of a sideline thing here, but it, you know, um, people argue about the authorships of, uh, you know, or, or you know, guys like um, Abraham and Moses, did he write the Pentateuch and stuff like that? But, um, but the authenticity here of the Bible, it, it kind of shouts out to us because um, if the Jews had their father, Abraham, written by Moses here, the Pentateuch, which the Bible claims that's what happened, um, would they have said their father had, uh, knowing the law, Moses was the giver of the law and he wrote the Pentateuch, would he have added this part that, he, that Sarah was Abraham's half-sister? I think they, that they would have cleaned that up. The author, if it, was, if it wasn't a true story, uh, that's the part you wouldn't include in the story. But it is included, and it kind of, to me, it, it, it speaks to the authenticity 
of authorship and, and even inspiration of the Bible. Does that make sense to you guys? You don't include the part that he's, she's a half-sister because that's just a no-no uh, for the Jews, especially according to the law. And then today we all know that's not a good, good idea for other reasons as well. But God, God uh, still blessed Abraham, who was, who was a very imperfect dude. I'm sure in Ur of the Chaldees, it was okay to marry your half-sister. Um, but that was not uh, God's plan, you know, but Abraham breaks that. I just, see, I just see, you know, people picture some of these Bible characters as these stained glass, you know, perfect individuals that never sinned. But the Bible doesn't pull any punches. Uh, all these guys get all their record uh, and it's there for all of history to see. So, um, you know, uh, now, although Abraham is the fa- considered the father, father of faith, um, he's known also for, for, for these, these really bad detours. And, and this detour uh, gets Pharaoh into trouble. Um, you know, uh, and we're gonna look at this. You know, shouldn't Abraham be the one in trouble for being such a you know, nincompoop, uh, telling his wife to tell everybody you know, she's his sister? Uh, but Abraham seems to get blessed and then Pharaoh gets a plague. Um, you always see uh, how the Lord plagues the Egyptians. It, it happens hugely uh, when Moses, you know, leads the children of Israel out of Egypt, talk about plagues. Now, we don't know what this plague is that Pharaoh has, but um, it might be his health is on the line, like even death. Um, there might be a link to, if you look up the Hebrew word for plagues in this case, um, the, the word stroke will come into mind. Uh, like if you had a stroke, of some kind that there's a link to that, uh, something interesting. So, um, so Pharaoh's got these plagues uh, and it seems like he knows, like, does God tell him? I think so, somehow God relays to Pharaoh, yeah, this guy's, this guy's lying to you, this is his wife. So that's why we see uh, verse 18. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that thou hast done to me? Why dost thou not tell me she was thy wife? Why saidst thou she is thy sister? For I might have taken her to be uh, to, to, to wife. Now therefore, behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Um, what an interesting story. Abraham takes a detour. Um, but how, how costly was this detour? How detrimental would this be to Abraham and his life and his marriage and his family and his future? Um, and how is it with us? And I remember these Old Testament stories are not just stories. They're, they're illustrations and pictures of what, what the Lord wants us to learn from and see for all of humanity. I think there's much for you and me as guys to glean from this story because we are prone to take detours that are misguided and really quite uh, stupid and, and they can cost you, the, 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 the detours of your life can cost you. And so this is something we should be really aware of. I've got some questions I'd like to roll through about this that I think are worth asking and stuff for us to consider. The first question is, um, what was the reason for Abraham's detour? Um, you know, well, you say, well, it was famine, a famine in the land. But, um, but here's the question. Was, was Abraham's plan of dealing with the famine legitimate? And I'm gonna say, no, it was not. Um, I, I would argue that famine wasn't the cause of the detour. Anybody wanna take a stab at what the real problem was? Huh? Fear, somebody said it, it was fear. Uh, oh, there's famine, huh, what are we gonna do? And, he, and, and fear, can I just say how many times in the Bible fear leads people to make really stupid mistakes? Um, you know, uh, the Bible is so clear on this and it's so funny how our culture is so driven by fear. Um, it just, to me, I'm, I'm, I'm catching myself just almost being so tired of, of fearful attitudes and fearful people. Uh, and I probably have to check myself on that. I have a shorter fuse. Like, you know, that's probably why I joke around about like driving to church on a, on a cold morning. And it's like, I, I, I just, I'd rather be guilty of being a dude that's gonna know how to drive in the snow and figure that out in case someday we really need to do that in an emergency situation. Like it's part of get, becoming a, a guy who knows how to drive in snow and do, be ready for stuff like that. Like, and, and yet a lot of people are like, oh, there's going to be, it's gonna be a little chilly out. You know, the news people are like, whatever you do, don't leave your homes, you know? And it's like, when it snows outside, I'm like, 
let's go. Let's go for a drive, like for no reason. That, that's what I do. Whenever it snows, I remember one time it snowed and they were all saying, oh, it's gonna be horrible, treacherous. And whatever you do, don't leave your house. And this is when the kids were little. And Joey remembers this. They were probably, you know, grade school age. And man, we got the kids in the truck and thought, let's go up to Camp 18 and have dinner. Like we went to Camp 18 for dinner just uh, on a snowy day. And it was, it was wonderful. It was a wonderful trip. And, um, but, uh, you know, some would say, well, that's stupid and, uh, and irresponsible. You know, there's a lot of women that would say, oh, I can't believe that he put his family at risk. And did that. like, there's people that would say stuff like that. But, um, but we're not to be given over to a spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound mind. Abraham lets fear drive this thing, both in two places. First, because of the famine. Oh no, what are we gonna do? We're gonna starve. Um, I'm gonna show you why he shouldn't have thought that because the Lord gave him some promises that, uh, that he's forgotten. I'll show you that in a second. The second component of fear was um, worried about what Pharaoh's men might do and he was fear, fearful for his life. Oh, they might kill me. So honey, please be the shield for me. Like, is that a, a manly, a strong thing to do? To hide behind your wife's skirt and uh, tell her to take the hit? Honey, don't worry, you could just be in his harem. That's great. Just as long as I'm still alive, that's all that matters. Um, there's a lot of men that have that kind of an attitude. Let the wife take the hit and you, just for your own comfort, she's gonna do all the hard stuff and you're gonna have the comfortable, nice life. That's actually a fearful sort of behavior. The, the Bible doesn't teach that men should be that, but instead it should be the opposite. We should be the protector. We should be the covering. We should be the one to take the hit. Abraham makes a huge mistake here by having his wife take the hit. Um, be careful, brothers. Uh, you know, where does this come out in, in, in today's, you know, if you're a single guy and you're like, Brett, I'm not married, so I don't have to listen to you. Well, you never know, you might get married someday. Um, but not only that, it's not only in marriage, but I think even in the church of Jesus Christ, the Lord wants men to lead and sort of take the hits. In, a, in a, a culture that says, no, women can do everything men can do. And churches that are you know, egalitarian saying, women can be pastors and elders just like everybody else. That's a very worldly sort of concept. It's not, it's not in the Bible. The Bible says men are to lead the church. Men are to cover. And women are to be given a place of honor in the church, not to be hit or put out there to you know, take those hits. Um, very unpopular for me to say that uh, today. You know, complementarian churches, uh, which is like Athey, where we have no women pastors or elders, um, we take the hit now. People hate churches like us, even though almost all the churches are that way, just like, you know, not that long ago in history. It's modern day, you know, progressive Christianity that's sort of made it so women can do everything men can do, just like the world. Aren't they happy about that? Um, but sadly, uh, I, want, I want to say, notice those churches and where they've gone in the past 10 years. A lot of those complementarian churches are strong and doing good, and the egalitarian churches are suffering and failing. It's, it's just sad. I'm not saying that pridefully. I'm saying that with a heart that's broken for the church of Jesus Christ. We've, we've made a detour in that one. Abraham is the one who makes the same mistake. Honey, I'll hide behind your skirt and you take care of me and, and protect me. And, and uh, you know, uh, it's, just, it's just so embarrassing for, for Abraham. Um, you know, so what was the reason for his detour? I think it really was uh, fear. Um, and the longer I'm in ministry and serving the Lord, I've been, you know, you know, a pastor, senior pastor or assistant pastor for 40 years now. Um, the longer I'm in ministry, I see... Um, people who uh, are uh, driven by fear and, and how dastardly and how destructive fear can be. Um, so all that to say, you know, um, uh, in the Bible, Egypt, you know, being a symbol of the world system and its bondage, what's the fear Abraham's, you know, what happens? His fear drives him to turn to the world rather than turn to the Lord. Um, when you find yourself turning to worldly solutions, uh, and, and instead of godly solutions, um, that often is something that you have to look at, why am I doing this? Fear is often the culprit. Um, I think Satan wants you to be a fearful man, fearful of this or feel fearful of that. Um, you know, um, so while the world is a symbol of, um, Egypt is a symbol of, of bondage, uh, the land of Israel is a picture of inheritance, blessing, and safety. All throughout the Bible, the land of Israel, where Abraham was when he built the altar near Bethel, 
That's where he was supposed to be. That's where God told him to be. But fear led him to the world, to Egypt, to the wrong thing. I wanna show you in Deuteronomy, uh, we read about this notion. Um, it says, for the land, whither thou goest in to possess it, uh, it is not as the land of Egypt from whence you came out, where thou sowest thy seed and waterest it with thy foot um, as a garden of herbs. In other words, you had to, in Egypt, you had to work really hard and haul water in by foot to grow stuff because uh, it was it's dry and desert. But the land, whither you go to possess it, is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it, which means protection, from the beginning of the year, even to the end of the year. In other words, year round, back in those days when Abraham and then ultimately Moses would go to the promised land leading the children of Israel, it was a land flowing with milk and honey, just naturally. It was like this beautiful oasis. Now, some of you have been to Israel and you're like, Brett, Israel's kind of a desert. Are you kidding? Well, it is now, but it's actually better than it was. Um, but over the uh, millennia, uh, Israel, the land of Israel has gone through some major transfer transformations. Um, one of the big ones, by the way, was when the Ottoman Turks were in control. Um, uh, one of the things that happened to Israel is uh, the whole climate changed uh, and it became very much desert. Um, and there's, there's debate on what made the whole climate change there. And it was so much more, um, you know, dry and barren. And, and like uh, even 150 years ago, it was a barren desert. The Jews through technology and drip systems and uh, desalinization science, the Jews have brought the land back to life. There, you can go through sections of Israel. It's like a beautiful garden again now, but that's fairly new. When the Ottomans were there, uh, they taxed, anybody who had a tree on their property, you were taxed according to how many trees you had. So to cut taxes, they fired up their chainsaws uh, and cut the trees down. Um, and it changed the whole climate of the country. It was so radical what happened in, in that, at that time, it was called Palestine. Um, they cut down all the trees and uh, some of the scientists say that's what hurt Israel's more modern day climate more than anything. So there's some interesting things about Israel. But during the time of Abraham and even Moses and when the children of Israel came into, Israel, into the land of promise, it was a land flowing with milk and honey and water raining from, you know, it was, it was like a tropical paradise in some ways. Um, and, and the Lord had his eye. Did you notice that the eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it? Um, now, one of the things, speaking of that, when, when, when you're in the Middle East and when you're in Israel, no matter where you are, if you're going to Jerusalem, you always say, we're going up to Jerusalem, whether you're north, south, east, or west. We don't say that. If you're going up to Seattle, would we ever say you're going down to Seattle? Um, we wouldn't say that. But in Israel, you, you'd say, we're going down to Jerusalem if you're, uh, uh, or up to Jerusalem if you're going to Jerusalem. And you'd always say you're going down to Egypt if you're going down to Egypt. That's kind of an interesting thing of the Bible. Uh, the reason I bring that up is um, we see that in Isaiah chapter 30. Listen to what the Lord says to the Jews. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that takes counsel, but not of me, and that covereth with a co covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, and to trust in the shadow of Egypt." One thing that we're seeing here in Genesis 12 is Abraham going down to Egypt, not trusting in the Lord. But the problem is the Jews followed their father's behavior. All the Jews um, really did follow that same sort of uh, behavior. Instead of trusting the Lord, they went down to the world for help. Um, are you doing that? Be careful, brothers. If you're fearful or if your life is shaken or there's something that troubles you or you're depressed or anxiety, Yet the thing you don't want to do is go down to Egypt, uh, trust in the world and godless systems to bring you back where you're supposed to be. Some guys, you know, try to medicate. Some guys try to go and get secular help and counseling from secular people who don't know God or don't know anything about his word. And oftentimes uh, we see that only cause more trouble in a man's life. Uh, spiritually speaking, going down to Egypt means doubting God's promise and running to the world for help. Jeremiah Chapter 42, verse 13 through 16. <clears throat> but if you say, we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying no, but we will go to the land of Egypt. And then it goes on to say, um, if you wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt 
and go to sojourn there, then it shall come to pass that the sword which you feared, there it is, the fear, shall overtake you. The very thing you were afraid of is the very thing that's gonna get you. Um, and it shall overtake you in the land of Egypt. And the famine whereof you were afraid shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there you shall die. <laughs> this is Jeremiah the prophet. Now this is long after Abraham. Abraham sort of set the precedent for this whole kind of idea of going down to Egypt, uh, you know, misguided plans. But all through the Bible, it just, it, you know, whether it's, you know, um, you know, Abraham or even his own son, Isaac, uh, well, you know, uh, his own son, Isaac would do similar things. Fear is one of the biggest causes of bad detours. Um, and so if you're being led by fear, you got to fix that. Um, don't let your fear guide you. Fear is one of the most uh, misleading uh, behaviors I think we can, we can be led by. Um, uh, you know, I think there's better things to be led, led by, but you know, the, the best thing to lead thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you're going to be driven in a direction, let the word of God drive you, but don't let fear do it. Um, and that's something I think we need to really be careful about. Um, so first question, what is the reason for the detour that Abraham makes? It's just fear. Um, boy, good, good thing to remember. That's one of the big things that causes bad detours. Number two question, what does the detour require of Abraham? When, when, we, when we make bad detours in life, um, it usually requires something of you that lacks character or integrity or... Um, you know, as soon as you're detouring in a bad direction, you're, it's going to cost you something. Um, and I think in Abraham's case, it was compromise and lies. Um, that's what he would have to, you know, that's what, that, that's what would be, you know, here's Mr. Father of Faith. But uh, what does the detour require? It requires Abraham to compromise his faith, even though he's the father of faith, but also lie and, and uh, not really be truthful with Pharaoh and, and the people there in Egypt. Um, sometimes, by the way, in the Bible, have you ever noticed how men fail in the area of their greatest strength? Have you ever noticed that? Um, here's Abraham, father of faith. And where does he falter? In the area of faith, right here. He's not trusting that the Lord has him in the promised land, the land that's going to be blessed and protected. So he bolts from the land of promise and, and goes down to Egypt because of fear. But it requires him to... Uh, to sort of do the very thing that he's famous for, being a father of faith, fail in faith. Um, another example of that is Moses. Um, Moses in the Bible is called the meekest man on the face of the earth. Uh, meekness is a beautiful attribute. Jesus you know, said of himself, it's the only autobiographical statement Jesus made about his own character. He said, I am meek and lowly of heart. That's, that's one of Jesus's main characteristics. And Moses was called meek. But in, in Moses' greatest failure, where did he blow it? It was in the area of not being meek. Remember uh, when, when he struck the rock the second time? You, you rebels, the King James puts it, the Latin says, you morons. That's what, that's what Moses yells at the people. And he smacks the rock a second time with the rod when he was supposed to only speak to it. <clears throat> now that little thing cost Moses. Even like I asked this question, what does the detour require? Well, Moses' detour in the area of his greatest strength, meekness, it cost him not being able to go to the promised land with the children of Israel. That, that little blunder of a detour in Moses' life would not allow him to get into the promised land. That's, that's so sad. That's part of a sad story. So, um, so you know, um, so he, he first of all has to lie. And, and you say, well, Brett, how, how is it a lie? Um, well, it's because of this half-sister thing. In fact, it is Genesis 26, verses 6 through 7. Um, this, I want you to see something here um, about his son, Isaac. This, this is going to cost Abraham more than he even imagines. It says in verse uh, 6 of Genesis 26, And Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and the men of the place asked him of his wife. Um, uh, and and he, he said, uh, she is my sister. For he feared to say, she's my wife, lest said he, the men of the place should kill me <clears throat> for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. Does this sound familiar? Oh no, Isaac, not the same old thing where, where your dad, you know, um, this, is, this is one of the hazards of being a dad. You dads know this. Your kids will imitate you and oftentimes in the areas you least want them to. 
Um, you'll see your kids doing things and saying things like, oh no, he's just like me, bummer. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's Abraham and Isaac. But, um, but isn't it a funny thing that, um, that uh, not only does Abraham, you know, pay the price a little bit himself, but now his son. And now, now what's funny is the Lord's gonna protect Isaac just like he protected Abraham and Sarah. I'll, I'll get into that in a second. But uh, Isaac was a chip off the old black block here. And um, one thing you have to remember, um, dads, what precedent are you setting for your sons? Are you setting a precedent of fear and your fear let it, guiding you to do stuff that is unhealthy spiritually? <clears throat> and your sons are seeing that because don't be shocked when your sons become men and they do handle those things the same way you did. Um, those, those little eyes that are watching you as little kids, they're gonna grow up to be um, adults that will often uh, mirror you. Abraham's the classic example of that, and I wanted you to see that. So <clears throat> when we ask the question, what does the detour require? I mean, it, it really does, it's compromise and lies, but also requires uh, of Abraham, just you know, his testimony his, uh, uh, to his own family, his example to his own son was not so good. Um, here's another question. And this is a question I would ask if there were women in the room. Well, Brett, why are you gonna ask it then? I'll tell you here in a second. But if women were in the room, I'd ask this, what if you're married to the one taking the detour? Can you imagine for a second, guys, um, being Sarah, the wife in this story? Um, would you want to kill your husband uh, for doing this, for being such a numbskull and saying, yeah, tell him you're my, my sister and <clears throat> go be in Pharaoh's harem um, so that I don't die. Um, now, what I love about this is the, you know, the Lord protects Sarah. You know, we know that he didn't take her in and you know, have sexual relations with her because Pharaoh says, man, I almost, I almost took her to be my wife. Like he, it was like a, you know, close to it, but uh, God plagued Pharaoh so much. Uh, you know, I love this because, um, you know, if you're married to the one taking the detour, especially if you know the Bible and this idea of the wives submitting to their husbands and here's Abraham, the father of faith, telling his wife to do something that's really misguided. I love how the Lord protected Sarah in the story. Um, that, that's such a beautiful thing. So, you know, what if you're married to the one taking the detour? I would tell the wife, you know, um, man, put your trust in the Lord. The Lord will protect you even if you have a nincompoop for a husband. That's what I would tell the wife. Um, the, Lord, the Lord is faithful in that. But this question, the reason I, I wanted to present this to you guys is, um, what is, ask yourself, those of you that are married, what does your wife have to put up with, with you? And be honest to yourself about this. Does your wife have to just, like, I, one thing I, again, in, in a lot of years of, of marriage counseling and stuff where I've talked to a lot of couples over the years, I'm, I'm actually amazed how much wives are willing to put up with. Um, they're kind of amazing. Uh, I think that men have way less patience. Uh, and uh, and I, I'm just, I, I, I'm often so impressed when I meet with a couple most of the time, rarely do I, I go out of a meeting and think, man, that guy is just being really patient, you know, and, and stuff like that. I, I rarely see that. But, but I oftentimes see where a, a wife is dealing with a guy that's just really misguided, making horrible choices uh, with a lot of things. And yet um, a good godly Christian woman uh, is, is just being strong. You know, look at Sarah. Um, you know, so since this is a group of men, it begs the question, are you leading your houses well? Are you being a good leader in your home? And are you making the right decisions that are gonna put your family in a place of blessing and success? Or is your wife one who's just gonna have to completely trust the Lord? Um, is your wife, you know, is your wife the noble Christian woman who will be rewarded in heaven greatly because she stood by her wacko, doofy husband? Just asking you, but I'm offended by that. Well, that means you're probably a doof. Um, uh, and you need to repent. If you're saying, no, Brad, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to walk with the Lord. You know, do you ever wonder if Abe is sitting in heaven right now and going, oh no, Athey Creek's going over Genesis 12 again. Oh man. Like, can you imagine being Abraham? I, I wonder, you know, Abraham's got a lot of good things he did, but I just wonder sometimes when I get to heaven, is Abe, Abe hey, Brad, come over here a second. How many times did you teach Genesis 12 to the congregation at Athey Creek? Like, come on, you know, like, like I wonder about that. But at the same time, Abraham fails in this, but man, are you the guy that is failing in the area of being a, a good, godly, loving, compassionate, caring husband? You know, putting your wife ahead of yourself. 
Um, you know, the one thing the Bible tells us that men in marriage is husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And what did he do? Gave himself for it. Abraham's not giving himself for his wife. He's putting his wife out there to give herself for him. Um, and man, that's always the wrong choice as a husband. Does your wife bear the burden financially? Oh, Brett, she's better at crunching the numbers than I am. Well, that's, that could be true. And maybe that's a good arrangement if she's the one crunching the numbers on the budget. But you should be the covering no, n nonetheless. You should be the one making sure she's not bearing the burden of the financial burden of how you're gonna pay the bills. Um, if she's bearing that burden, that weight, you're putting her out there to, to, to have to take the hits. And you're just going along happy and free. Now, some of you guys are really bad. You're the guy that has the wife crunch the numbers, but you go out and buy stuff for your truck and you get stuff for your gun collection and you get this and that. And your wife's going, where, where did all that money go? Uh, we got to buy groceries. Sorry, honey. Um, uh, you know, you're the one who's crunching the numbers. Good luck with that. Um, if you're that guy, time to repent. Um, and you shouldn't be hiding behind the skirts of your wife. Um, you, you should be covering and leading well. Uh, I'm sorry if this hurts, but it's just true. Um, you gotta be the man that is um, putting your wife ahead of yourself. Um, and Abraham makes this huge mistake in this case. Um, so that's a good question to ask. You know, what if you're married to the one taking the detour? Um, man, the poor wife, she had to take the hit here. Um, but as men, we should not be the ones uh, putting our wives in harm's way. We should be doing the opposite of that. Well, number four on the list question, uh, uh, what happens to your witness on the detour? Well, we see Pharaoh was totally baffled by, um, you know, Abraham's uh, behavior. Did you see that? Um, it, you know, in verse 17, Pharaoh was, uh, the Lord plagued Pharaoh's house. So verse 18, Pharaoh called Abraham, what is this that thou hast done unto me? Why did you not tell me? Do you think um, Pharaoh wanted Abraham around anymore? Well, the Bible tells us here, he, uh, Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Uh, get out of my face. How was Abraham's testimony as a godly man to the world? His, his, his testimony, his witness, you might call it, went out the window. Uh, the world looked at him and said, what a weirdo, just get him out of our town. Um, bad behaving Christian men, can be one of the worst things, you know, as far as being an example of what a godly man is supposed to be. If we're, if we're messing up on all our little detours of, of going where God doesn't want us to go, don't think that people are gonna wanna become a Christian. Um, you know, your witness to the world can be completely lost. Um, if we call ourselves Christians, then our lives are supposed to be a witness. Um, uh, you know, a lot of times we misconstrue the idea of witnessing uh, you know, uh, because we think it's going out like um, Ray Comfort on Huntington Beach and, you know, finding, you know, a bunch of atheists and witnessing to them. Um, and that's great. That's a form of witnessing. But <clears throat> did you know that the, 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 the word actually says it more like this, go out into the world and be witnesses. Um, is there a difference between those that are witnessing versus those that are being a witness? Yes, there's a difference. To be a witness is to just let your life be a shining testimony of, it should be, your, your life should stand out um, so that people say, whatever you have, that's what I want. Is that what Abraham gets here in Egypt? They're, they're like, man, Abraham, he's a lucky guy. He's got a beautiful wife. I wish I could be like him. No, they're saying, get out of Egypt. You know, uh, the Christians should stand out as something. You know, um, you know, here in Portland, you know, our, all of our cars, especially with all the, you know, uh, the weather now, you know, our cars get all dirty and brown and gray, and pretty soon they all look the same color. And then, and then when the sun comes out, the lines at the car washes, man. Um, but you can always tell the car that's just been freshly through the car wash. You're like, oh yeah, man, I should probably go wash. I haven't washed my truck for three years. I should probably go run it through the rot. Wash. But, um, but um, you know, in some ways, when you see that car that's just sparkling and shining, in, in a way, that should be the Christian man. Everybody should come up and say, wow, your life is different. You're not just grayed out with like everybody else in the world, but you stand out as one who's been washed in the blood of the lamb, cleansed and saved, and the world should want to be like you. This is something I always brag on my dad because I, I, I saw this uh, so practically on the job site. Um, he was always the superintendent, you know, of the jobs that I got to work on as a kid on those job sites. But 
Um, but as a super, you know, they, they would all come up and they would say, man, what is, how, what's the secret? They'd come up to me and say, what's your dad's secret? You know, like, what does he do? And, and, and they'd even come up to him, you know, and say, Todd, what, why, how is it that you are a guy who can, you know, as, you know, as a young, he, he started as, as a superintendent uh, at the age of 23. He, he was a superintendent on a job when he was 23 years old um, back at the Chet, I think it was, was it the Chetco River? It might not have been Chetco River Bridge. Has anybody been to the Castaic Lake? down in California by Saugus, by Magic Mountain, the big lake down there? Yeah, one guy, okay. Big lake, all the big uh, wakeboarding tournaments are there. It's kind of a big deal. My dad was a 23-year-old superintendent on that job when they built that dam. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got pictures of him as a young guy, but he was leading. But even at that time, people would say stuff like, you know, Todd, like, what, what, what is, how, how are you so different? And how do you not, you know, you know, get mad at your wife and, you know, beat your kids and go to the bar after work and get drunk. Like how they saw something different in him. And so men would come up and ask him. I saw that his whole life. And I remember thinking that's what it need, means not to go out. I think witnessing should almost be less words and more just being the man God's called you to be. As soon as you take that detour in life, your witness goes down the tubes. And that happened to Abraham. He, he could have been a witness uh, to the world, uh, but instead they, they said, get out of Dodge, uh, and, and he had to leave. Uh, so hopefully your lives, my life, uh, we are men living a testimony of God's goodness. So, so much that people go, wow, that person has a peace and they're just calm and they seem squared away. Um, I'd like to have that kind of peace in my life. You know, what do I need to do? And that's where we can then use the words part. So the answer to that is Jesus, to repent of your sins, be saved, accept Christ. Um, so what's the reason of the detour? Fear. What does the detour require? Man, when you start going off course, you're going to have to compromise your faith, lies, and you're compromising your family's, you know, uh, future like, like Abraham did. What if you're married to the one taking the detour? Man, uh, God will protect you, but we shouldn't be that guy that has our wives having to take the hits for us. Um, what happens to your witness? on a detour, it goes down the tubes. Number five, uh, what happened to Abraham's walk during the detour? Um, now, if you're new to Christianity, we have a word that we use, Christianese, and the word is walk. Um, and the walk means your steady progress and how you're relating to the Lord on a daily basis. Do you have a walk with the Lord? Somebody who's walking with the Lord is someone who is pleasing the Lord, like uh, you know um, Enoch, he walked with God and he pleased God. Those are the two things said of Enoch. But uh, walking in, implies steady progress. You're not you know up and down, roller coastering in your walk. It's just a steady daily walk with the Lord. That's a healthy thing. Um, but what happens to your daily walk with the Lord? You know, I would say we started our story this morning um, with a, a healthy walk. Uh, Abraham's there at Bethel and the Ai between heap of ruin and house of God. And what does he do? He's building an altar that day and he's, he's um, seeking the Lord and, 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 and you know, calling out to the, on the name of the Lord. That's what a good walk is. It's a good walk. Um, a good walk today in modern day terms, a guy who reads his Bible every day, a guy who prays, a guy who prays with his wife every day. Uh, a, a guy that makes church a priority in his family, like Joshua, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's, that, you show me a guy with a steady, progressive walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll show you a strong, steady, squared away dude. Um, so a walk is important. But what happened to Abraham's walk? If you observe, uh, you know, he starts out before he goes down to Egypt with the altar, calling out the Lord. But um, during Abraham's detour, he never once talks with the Lord and he doesn't, we don't see him building any altars. We just see him lying and compromising and shaking in his sandals. That's all we see. When you take a detour, one of the things, not only does your witness go down the, the tubes, but your steady walk with the Lord st starts to dissipate. Um, you know, what happens when we sin and do the wrong thing? We, we find ourselves separated from God, not walking with God. Um, remember Adam in the in Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eve story? What did they do? Uh, every day they'd walk with the Lord in the cool of the day. That's a great walk right there. But what's the first thing that went out the window when they took a chomp of the fruit? Their daily walk. Instead of walking with the Lord, what did they do? They went and hid themselves in the bushes 
and they were hiding from the Lord. That's what happens when you detour is your walk disappears. That's why Isaiah 59, one and two says, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy or deaf that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, that's a fancy word for sins, have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So when Abraham takes his detour, um, he's, he's not really walking with the Lord at this moment. Um, and this is not a place a guy like Abraham should be. He needs, he needs a walk with the Lord. Um, you know, I, I think Abraham, again, not only is he's, he's famous for being called the father of faith, but there's a secondary title that he's given. Does anybody know what the second title is Abraham's given in the Bible? Father of faith and the Yes, somebody got it. Friend of God. We find that in James 2, 23, where it says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Um, that's another big title. I mean, if you're, you're, if you're a dude and you get your name in the Bible and you get those two things, father of faith, friend of God. Man, that's a win-win right there if you ask me. But how was Abraham's friendship with God going when he was on his detour? Um, I think that his friendship with God, you know, it wasn't God who was failing in the area of friendship. It was Abraham. Um, have you ever been out of sorts with a friend? Um, or maybe I could ask you married guys, have you ever been out of sorts with your wife? You know, you, you're, you've had something you did and you're, you know you're in the dog pound, so you get home from work, hi, honey. And she's like, hi. It's not, it's not the hi that is a loving and embracing. It's like, hello. You're like, oh man, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Some of you guys are newly married guys. You're like, oh good, she's doing great. She said hi to me. Um, you'll start to learn there's a tone. Honey, how are you doing? Fine. That's not really fine. Uh, that's actually, things are horrible. Uh, but you gotta learn that when, when you get older like me. Uh, you start to interpret those kinds of things. Um, out of sorts with a friend, it's kind of a bummer. It's a bummer to be out of sorts with a friend or your spouse. Um, but it's even worse to be out of sorts with God. And you know, God's not the problem here when that happens. You and I are, when we take the detour like Abraham, we, we shouldn't be shocked when our friendship with God is not going so well. Um, I, I think there's guys that I, I've talked to and counseled where they come and say, Brett, I just feel really distant from God. I feel like I'm really in a dry time. I feel like I, you know, I once was, had this really clo close relationship with the Lord, what's happening? I would ask the question, did you ever take a detour and never really come off of that detour? Are you, are you embracing things that you once didn't embrace that, are, that, that the, we might see in the word is called sin? And because of that sin, you, you don't realize it, but you're sort of separated from God. It's your sin, your iniquity that separates you from God. That's what Isaiah 59 says. So here we've got Abraham, you know, uh, you know what happened to Abraham's walk? It kind of goes down the tubes. Uh, while he's in Egypt, he's not talking with the Lord. He's not walking, walking with the Lord. I'd say he's walking like an Egyptian <laughs> and talking like an Egyptian because um, he's, he's lying and deceiving and he's doing all this stuff, uh, something we should watch out for. So number six on our questions. You see, I'm just rambling on questions. I'm almost done. Two more, number six. Um, question number six that I would ask, what did God do about Abraham's detour? Well, um, in, a, in a few words, he blessed Sarah and he blessed Abraham. Did you notice that? What did God do to Abraham on this case? Um, I'm gonna say something that's crazy. He blessed Abraham. Did you see what happens? The implication here, by the way, you, you can kind of miss it in the King James if you're not careful, but when it says um, in verse 16 uh, that Pharaoh entreated Abraham well for her sake, you know, Pharaoh thought, oh, uh, Sarah's his sister. Cool, I want her in my harem. So Pharaoh treats Abraham well. And how, well, what did he do to him? That's where the second part of that verse, um, you might just think, well, Abraham had uh, a bunch of sheep, oxen, donkeys, men servants, maid servants, she asses and camels. But that's not the idea. The idea is Pharaoh hooked Abraham up with sheep, donk donkeys, oxen, slaves, <laughs> like, isn't it interesting uh, uh, that Abraham is a total idiot in the story, but God allows Abraham to be hugely blessed. 
There's a word for this in the Bible. Anybody know what that word is? It's grace. That's what God is. God is gracious. What is grace? Mercy is the Lord forgiving us when we, when we deserve something bad. And the Lord says, I'm, I'm gonna be merciful to you. Grace is you've done something bad and then the Lord blesses your socks off even though you're a complete nincompoop. That's what grace is. You know, it's amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We're saved by God's grace. We don't deserve it. We didn't earn it, but it's a free gift. So here's Abraham on a detour down to Egypt doing really stupid things. And yet he goes away from the story um, completely uh, hooked up and blessed. Um, uh, there's a story of a pastor who, uh, you know, shouldn't have done this, but he called in sick. He was lying. The reason he called in sick that Sunday morning is because it was a beautiful sunny day and he just thought to himself, I don't care what the congregation thinks. I deserve to go play a round of golf and nobody will know they're all at church. I'll be there on Sunday morning. So the, the pastor goes off to the golf course. He has one of his you know, assistant pastors cover and he goes out there and, and it's a beautiful sunny day. Well, meanwhile, back up in heaven, Peter's talking to God and he says, Lord, how can you let this happen? You're, you're letting this pastor, he's playing hooky. He should be at church when he's, and he lied. He said he was, saying, and he said, you can't, and look, it's a sunny day, Lord. Come on, at least some rain or something. And the Lord said, Pete, be still. <laughs> well, the, the pastor goes out and starts you know, playing. He said, just having a wonderful day. Peter's like, come on, Lord. What, why are you letting him have, be still, Pete. Um, well, finally on the, on the, on the the 18th hole, the pastor tees it up at the, uh, you know, it's a big, it's a big, long fairway. And man, whack, whack, the, the pastor takes his big swing and it just flies straight through there, perfectly down the middle of the fairway, drops onto the green, bounces a few, and then drops into the cup, hole in one. And Peter's like, Lord, this is horrible. What are you doing? And the Lord said to Peter, who can he tell? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, you wonder, why is the Lord gracious to us when we're just a bunch of sinners? That's just God's nature. God's nature is to be kind-hearted and benevolent. And even when we're really sinful and, and misguided and we do horrible things, the Lord is still gracious to us. Um, that's that's the, the key of this. Now, you might say, well, Brett, if that's the case, then I'm just gonna go on and make all kinds of detours and sinful stuff. If God's just gonna be grace, Paul said, should we continue in sin and let grace abound? What does he say? God forbid. Why should we not wanna sin if God's going to be gracious, gracious, which he will. Why should we? The answer is God will be gracious, but sin costs you. And be sure of this. It's not God will find you out. The Bible says in uh, Numbers uh, you know, 23, 32, be sure of this, your sin will find you out. Your sin catches up to you. So what does God do about Abraham's detour? God blesses his socks off. He becomes, at this point, this is where Abraham becomes an extremely wealthy man. Um, I'll show you that in a second. But, um, but uh, you know, Abraham doesn't get off scot-free because there's some repercussions of his detour that would be long-lasting. How long-lasting? The repercussions of Abraham's trip to Egypt plagues the world to this day. Um, how does it plague the world? Come on, he just went down to Egypt and then he left and how, how can that plague the world today? Well, the answer goes with the rest of the story. Abraham, when he goes there, Pharaoh hooks him up with all this stuff, but notice that Abraham picks up some servants there. One of those servants was a nice looking young lady named Hagar. Abraham picks up Hagar, this Egyptian servant <clears throat> um, uh, and brings her along with them. Uh, uh, one of, and, and one of the, Hagar, the servant, would be given to Sarah as her handmaid. And if you know the rest of the story, Hagar and you know, Sarah, Sarah would say, hey, you know, I know we're supposed to have a promise line, but here, sleep with my handmaid, Hagar, and she'll, be, she'll give the baby because I'm too old. You know, you know the whole story. And so Abraham stupidly sleeps with Hagar. He's like, cool, whatever, honey. If you want me to sleep with Hagar, I'll do it. Um, another detour of Abraham's. Um, but this detour, that detour was because of this detour. Do you see the problem here? You can take a detour in life and the Lord will forgive you and he'll bless you by his grace and you move on in life. But one of the things you might not really be calculating in is, uh, you know, sin has a way of catching up with you. Even though the Lord forgives you, even though he's been gracious to you, Hagar is picked up here in this story and then he sleeps with Hagar and gives birth to Ishmael 
which becomes the father of the Arab nation. Isaac is born to Sarah, which they became enemies, even as children. Ishmael and Isaac were enemies. Abraham has to kick out Ishmael and Hagar and, and doom them to the wilderness um, because Sarah was upset, uh, understandably. But then the, those two nations, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jews, um, Ishmael becomes the father of the Arab nation and the Arab-Israeli conflict's been going ever since because of Abraham's misguided detour. Have you ever wondered how far reaching your detours will affect you and your family? I think people don't count that cost. Be not deceived, Galatians 6, 7. God is not mocked for whatsoever man sows, that will he also reap. Don't forget God's grace, but what you sow, that's what you're gonna reap. And here Abraham's sowing when he makes this detour. And if I blow off my role as a leader, there's not only gonna be heartbreak in my family, but even my own life personally, and, and maybe even in future things. But all that to say, God is still gracious to Abraham. I love that. Well, be careful. Uh, I don't think we count the cost of what our detour is actually gonna cost us. Well, there's one more question I'd like to ask, and then we'll pack it up for the day. Um, um, so what did Abraham, how did, I should say, how did Abraham get it right? Um, how, how did he correct his course? Um, well, that's where we pick it up in ver chapter 13. Let's just read four more verses. Chapter 13, verses one through four. It says there, and Abraham went up out of Egypt. Okay, now we're headed in the right direction. By the way, that's what repentance is. Um, repentance means to change your direction. He was going down to Egypt, stayed there for a while, but he's like, I gotta get out of here. Now, it was the Lord who sort of made it happen because Pharaoh freaked out, said, okay, get out of here. But Abraham turns around and goes the opposite direction, goes back. That's what repentance is. I hope you understand that because we're all called to be repentant brothers. We're supposed to repent of our sin, change direction. That's what it means. Verse one is where he repents. And verse two, Abraham was very rich in cattle and silver and gold. That's because of God's grace. Verse three, and he went on his journeys from south, from the south, even to Bethel, back to Bethel, uh, unto the place where uh, his tent had been at the beginning and between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Okay, now we're back. He's walking with the Lord again. Do you see this? He, he repented, turned back, and went back to do the things he did before. You know, this, this is a common thing in the Bible. Uh, remember the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter two? They, uh, they were doing some good things, but they also had some bad things. And the biggest thing is they had left um, their first love for God. Um, so Jesus says, unless you change your, your direction, unless you change your, your Ephesus, your, your candle's gonna be snuffed out. So the Lord Jesus gives them the remedy to their rebellion uh, of leaving their first love for God. How did they fix it? Um, the same thing that Abraham does here. And, and let me show you this verse in Revelation 2, 5, speaking to the church of Ephesus. says, remember, Jesus says to the church, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick from out of the, this place, except thou repent. The remedy for the church at Ephesus had, who had left their relationship with God. Remember Abraham, the friend of God, wasn't so friendly when he was in Egypt. But what did Abraham do? He repented and he went back to the old place and was redoing the things he was doing when he was walking with the Lord. This is the remedy for you and for me. In fact, there's three things. This is, if you're a family devotion father, this is a great scripture for family devotion. You got a three point teacher teaching here. Yeah, you got repent, number one. Um, pardon me, number one, remember. <laughs> remember from whence thou art fallen. Like, like that's one of the keys. If you're walking away from the Lord and your walk is on a detour the, and you start feeling, man, I'm distant from God. I'm going through dry time and I don't feel as close as I once was to God. You gotta start with remember, where did I lose it? I wonder if Abraham was in Egypt and when he got kicked out of Egypt, like, where am I gonna go now? I wonder if he had to remember, oh, I was doing pretty good when I was at Bethel and calling out to the Lord and, having the altar in front of me. And so you gotta remember from whence thou art fallen, go back. So then, so what do you do? You first remember, then number two, you repent. Uh, remember, repent. That means to change direction. And that's when he turned and went back. And you and I need to do the same thing. Go back to that place when you were doing good. <clears throat> and then the third one is do, 
go back, remember, repent. And if you want to make it a three R thing, you can say redo. Remember, repent, and then redo the first works. Or, or you might say repeat. Repeat what you were doing when things were healthy. Um, this is the same uh, remedy that God gives to the church at Ephesus. He gives really to Abraham. Go back to Bethel, where the altar is, uh, which is speaking of the cross. See, this is the beautiful thing for you and me as guys. Um, if, you, if you've uh, taken a detour, Satan wants to tell you right now, well, Pastor Brett's telling you to get off your detour, but it's so complicated. Uh, it's so complicated. There's no way you can get back on course. And you've just gone so far. How are you going to reel in all those troubles and problems of your detour? And maybe your addiction to this or your com commitment to that or your job in there. And, and, and Satan wants to make things look really difficult and tough. But can I just say, um, getting right, making things right as a, a believer, Jesus did all the work for us. All you got to do is remember, where, where were you doing good? Go back and, and repent, turn around and go. Remember, repent, and then repeat the things you were doing when things were healthy. Turn it back, turn all the dials back, start over, start fresh, clean slate. Um, and that's an important thing. So if you're a man who's maybe catching a few Egyptian things, if you're maybe walking like an Egyptian or talking like an Egyptian, um, you need to remember, repent, and then redo Go back to that faithful walk that you once had with the Lord. Um, it's time to get back to Bethel, the house of God, where the altar of the Lord is. That's for us as men. Can I just say the, um, the, um, the, the snapback to uh, these can be brutal or not so brutal, depending on how long you go. It's, it's called uh, rubber band theology. <laughs> If you're a guy who takes a detour and you're supposed to be on this path and you start going over here, detouring, the Lord, if, if you're a believer and you're a Christian, I think the Lord's got a rubber band about you. He's not gonna let you get so far away, but he gives you a certain free will. You can go do what you want. But what I've learned over the years is you can start going against the Lord and things get harder and harder the further out you go. And you're wondering, whoa, man, this is real, why, why is life so hard? It's because you're on a detour it's, and the stretch is getting harder and harder. But can I just say the snapback is gonna be based on how far you went before you repented. I've seen some guys get off course and they sense something's a little off and they repent and they kind of are able to come back under control. I've known some other guys who just stretch the rubber band out so far that snap, it doesn't feel good. I've been, in my office, I've had guys who prominent, you know, uh, known pillars of the community who committed adultery, had a sexual relationship with another woman, had it going on for a long time. Um, and the snapback from that was devastating. And you know, the Lord will still be gracious as he always is and forgiving and merciful, but the repercussions of something like that can be horrifying for a man. His children won't respect him. His wife, whether she stays with him or not, that's a whole nother thing. But, you know, you, you, the snapback is, is going to be directly determined about when you repent. And if some of you guys are walking against the Lord right now and you're thinking, I'm pulling it off, I'm pulling it off. But it, I, I tell you, it's going to get harder and harder and the snapback is going to be painful. Better to repent today than to repent tomorrow. Um, better to not detour from the Lord, but just stay on the path that he wants you to be. So just there's some practical, I think very practical, uh, uh, biblical advice. It's not Brett's advice. This is, this is a story recorded through all history for guys like you and me to say, oh Lord, help us to not make the same mistake that Abraham, that Isaac, that Jacob, that Moses, that David, that all these, like that's amazing how all these Bible characters, they all did the same thing. Why? Because guess what? We do that. That's human nature. Help us to learn here in the sanctuary rather than out in the storm. Uh, may the Lord give us ears to hear in Jesus' name. Let's pray. So Lord, as we pack it up this morning, I pray that this section of scripture and the reminder of this, um, just keeping our walk steady. Um, Lord, I pray that you'd help us as men to stay the straight and narrow path. Um, convict our hearts, all of us, Lord, if there's areas we need to repent, uh, return and remember uh, and redo the thing, the early things we used to do. Help us to set the dials back, Lord. We thank you for your grace. We love you, Lord, for your mercy that endures forever. But we pray that you would just um, nudge us and remind us 
where we've been misguided. So bless my brothers. I pray that as we go our way today, that we'd find ourselves just walking with you, uh, having that friendship with you and, and, uh, and enjoying that relationship. So we pray these things, Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.